haven't met me, uh, I'm Daryl Heath, and I'm serving as the CAST president uh, this year. Yeah, yeah. And welcome, everyone. Uh, we're glad to have you. Still looking forward to that time when we can get together and, and meet on site, in person. But as it is, we're still doing uh, these uh, Zoom uh, monthly club meetings, which seem to be working fairly well. Uh, we've got some feed positive feedback on them. Uh, so, anyway, welcome, everyone, tonight. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, doing. Uh, astrophotography with uh, the club's robotic telescope. And as a NASA employee, I feel compelled to tell you that you can also use NASA's micro observatory. Uh, and I just did this recently. I've got a picture of the Hercules cluster that I'm working on right now. It's free. All you have to do is just go on, uh, sign up, uh, put uh, a request in to use one of their many robotic telescopes that are scattered around the country and just type in, tell it what you want to image and uh, for how long you want the exposure, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then it'll send you a, a file of the raw data and then you have to process the image. But there are tutorials at the Micro Observatory website, video tutorials that'll tell you all about how to do that. So anyway, if you just wanna kind of dip your toes in the astrophotography arena, that's a good way to go about it. Um, one other announcement I had, uh, the last time we met, I'd spoken to uh, a person at uh, the Pinnacle Mountain State Park and they talked about uh, us coming out and doing star parties. Well, <clears throat> she's gotten more uh, a word on that. The state parks is now telling her, no, not any star parties. They, they don't want any events, they, but they are allowing programs. And mm -hmm. an event uh, would be a star party with a large gathering. A uh, program would be uh, a constellation tour of the night sky with just a small group of maybe 10 or 12 people. Uh, so I might volunteer to help them out with that. But anyway, uh, for right now, star parties are still on hold. And But I'll let you know as soon as I hear word otherwise. Daryl, just a quick question. Yeah. Which is, I, I, I remember I sent an email. There's a fuzzy area there. So if we have an official program through them sponsoring it, we can uh, enforce the COVID-19 restrictions, mask and social they, distancing. They will be doing that, yeah. Okay, great. Because that was the problem with trying to use some of the other facilities if we were sponsoring it on their, their property. Yeah, no, they, uh, if we're holding it on state property, we will follow the guidelines. Uh, okay, good. They outline. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Does anyone have any other uh, announcements they want to make at this time? Uh, reminder, uh, Daryl, that we have a board meeting coming up before the next uh, chat session, which it should be in two weeks, yeah. I believe, two weeks from now. Uh, the chat session starts at seven. As usual, the board meeting, I think we, we put it down at six o'clock. Uh, and the other thing is, is that um, ANSA is plowing forward with the uh, uh, Arkansas's first Dark Sky Festival. This coming October 1st and 2nd, and there'll be more information coming on that to be, be, be held at Gilbert, Arkansas. <clears throat> we'll be looking Great. for volunteers. You put me down. Got you down. <laughs> <laughs> Are you in the bat cave? No, you're, yeah, you're in the man cave. Yeah, I'm in the bat cave. Right. Okay. Bat cave. All right. Uh, anyone else have any announcements they'd like to make? All right. Well, we're going to proceed. Actually, on. I just wanted to remind everyone that we have three telescopes that we've been loaning out. All three are loaned out currently. We have a six inch uh, Dobsonian and an eight inch Dobsonian, both on Alt Azimuth mounts. And we've been loaning out a five inch uh, Celestron Next Star. And people have been enjoying it. So, anyone else that's interested in borrowing that to tell those, any one of those telescopes, please email me. I'll put you on the list. And as we cycle them through, we'll get them to you. And I'll just add to that, if you're not already familiar with this program, uh, CAS uh, partnered with the Central Arkansas Library System and uh, the people I work for, the Arkansas uh, uh, Space Grant Consortium, and we have funded the local libraries with mm -hmm. telescopes. So uh, you can go to any of the local branches of the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society our Central Arkansas Library System and check out uh, a loaner telescope. It's a five inch uh, uh, dob uh, on a a, a, it's just a small thing on it on the base that you have to put on a table. And, but anyway, it's, they're great telescopes and uh, you're, you're welcome to check those out uh, just like you can a book. I think you get two weeks with them. 
Um, there is usually a waiting list to get on these things. So uh, uh, still check it out and get your name on a waiting list if you don't have a scope and you want access to one. Right. The three scopes I mentioned are all CAS instruments. And you're right, there's a waiting list too. So get on the waiting list and we'd love to have you get a telescope. Okay, any other announcements? All right, well, we're going to get on with tonight's programming. And first up, we're going to have Robert Togni, uh, otherwise known to us as Rocky. If you have never met Rocky, he is our night sky guru. He, if there's anything to know about the night sky, Rocky knows it. And if, if he doesn't know it, then it's not worth knowing. Uh, so Rocky is also the author, and I don't have a copy. Well, I do have a copy. Hold on. Rocky is the author of Learning the Constellations. This is a publication that you can get through ANZA. Uh, this is a great little guide to help you learn the night sky. I've used, I give them as gifts to people that are, are wanting to learn the constellations. Uh, this is a great little book. So check that out. He'll even autograph it for you. <laughs> I will. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Rocky, you're doing a constellation on Caney's Fanatasy tonight. Is that right? That's right. All right. Well, I'm turning it over to you. And everyone, if you would, mute your, your microphones right now. Uh, this one, the original, uh, we've all heard of uh, Bayer because we got our, num our lettering system from Bayer. And uh, so this is one of his charts that he published in 1603. That had the uh, that had the number you can't you can barely see him. He makes them so small, and they probably didn't even have reading glasses back then. But uh, there's an A and a P right here on uh, on uh, the Great Bear, and you can see the Big Dipper. But anyway, you can see down here where uh, this is uh, Corcoroli and uh, Canis Venatici, and you can see there bef before then um, it was a uh, it was just out there, out there, and, and wasn't counted. It wasn't in wasn't in Ptolemy's forty eight original constellations, uh, uh, but it, it happened. It, I'll tell you how it came to be about next. Johannes Hevelius uh, lived in the uh, 17, 1600s, and he was mayor of Danzig in Poland. In Poland. He was an astronomer and gained a uh, reputation as the founder of lunar topography and had 10 new constellations uh, and seven of them are still used. Canis Venatici was one of them, Lacerda the Lizard, Leo Minor the Small Lion, Lynx, Scudum, Sextons, and Vulpicula the Fox. And there's a um, there's an astrolabe program now called Alternate Constellations and it's been, I've been working on it and it's pretty interesting. And he took a constellation named uh, the River Jordanus, that River Jordan, I guess, uh, that ran through the sky. And it started with Canis Venatici and I think it ended with Lynx and went through uh, Leo Minor and maybe Lacerda, I don't remember exactly. And he split them up into these, into four constellations. And then he did a, a he also did some other constellations that were popular at one time, uh, but they've not been adopted by the uh, constellation people and, and Const Triangular Minor, Mons Manilus, and I'll show you where that is in a minute, Servius, which is off of Aquila, and uh, Musca Borealis, which is the Northern Fly. And um, so here's one of, his, one of his, from his star catalog, and of course they, they, uh, uh, had very ornate star maps back then. You can't really see the stars a lot of times because I, I have a hard time making out. Uh, I think this is uh, the two main stars in, in, in Canis Benetici now. But uh, you can see he depicted it as two greyhounds nipping at the heels of the great bear. And you can see the great bear, you know, here's the Big Dipper right here. And Buotes was the bear herder that drove the uh, great bear around the, uh, around the North Star. Uh, so, 
and and this this map is backwards compared to our maps. Uh, during this time, uh, they they uh, had maps like they were on a globe, uh, opposite of what we look at the way we look at maps. The next slide will show you a, a similar one that was this was 1690, and this was uh, this is depicted from uh, Uranus mirror in 1825, and you can see a uh, Buote is holding holding his two dogs leashes in his in his left hand. And uh, this one doesn't show the bear. I, I like the other one because it shows the bear, shows them ni actually nipping at the heels of the bear. One thing that, that's been added since then is uh, this Alpha, Alpha Canis Benetici has been uh, named. This has got the name Corcaroli now. Uh, and and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Something, a couple of other things you can see here are a couple of off sleep constellations. One is uh, quadrants, uh, let's see, the, where the quadrants muralis. And of course, a lot of, a lot of us, have, uh, some of us have seen uh, meteors from the quadranted meteor showers, which is one of the better meteor showers of the year. The only trouble is it happens on like January the 4th when it's pretty cold and uh, cloudy a lot of times. Uh, and the other one is down here at the bottom. And this is one of Hevelius's constellations. There's some pretty dim stars down at the bottom of Buotes that he made into a mountaintop for, for uh, Buotes to be standing on. And that's one, one of the constellations that didn't make it. Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the two dogs. That's my, okay. Uh, so you can see this is almost, it's split into two, two, two dogs and the, Northern dog is named Asterion, and the southern dog is named Chera. Um, and there's actually cut some star groups that, that kind of represent these. This is one of those uh, observations for the alternate conservation constellation program. And I went out on a good night to a fairly dark site. I, I think I had set, thought I had limiting magnitude 5.5, and here's here's the Big Dipper. Here's Corcaroli and Chara, and here's a little ast you know, some st fifth mag basically fifth magnitude stars that make up the northern dog. And the southern dog actually includes Corcaroli and Chara, which is the name of the second star uh, and, uh, in this area right here. So anyway, and, and you can actually, I mean, it's, these were distinctive to me. So that was kind of fun seeing, uh, Asterion and, and Chara. And here's how you find it. Uh, I've got the spring diamond, one of my favorite asterisms on here. And, um, and you take the Big Dipper and, and for it, you'd make an arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica and then finish it out with Denebola and Corcaroli. Uh, it's kind of in the I like to think of if you made a circle out of the out of the handle of the Big Dipper, uh, Corcoroli would be at the center of it. So it's just kind of south of that uh, the handle of the Big Dipper. Um, but Corcoroli shines at magnitude two point nine, uh, and it's a it's a nice double star that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, Chari or Beta Canis Benedicti shines at a, a magnitude 4.2 and why right, right in this area right here is named Y Canis Venetici is La Superba and it's a, a variable star I think 4.9 and uh, I think it goes to I've seen two different references one goes to 5.9 and one goes to 7.3 and I'm, I'm planning on watching that for a while and seeing, seeing what I think about that. And then deep, there's a lot of deep sky objects. There's five Messier objects in Canis Venetici. Uh, M3 is an outstanding globular cluster. M51 is is the uh, is the one that everybody wants to photograph or photograph. I think uh, a double spiral galaxy. M63, the Sunflower Galaxy, and then M94 and M106. So there's a lot of deep sky objects in in Canis Venetici. Uh, 
Corcoroli is a really pretty uh, double star in a small telescope. Magnitudes 2.9 and 5.6, and they're 19.6 inches apart, which is pretty, you can, you can do that with a fairly small telescope, probably a, a three inch or something like that. Uh, and you can, you can, I think, I, I think this, this picture is a pretty good color representation of what they are. Uh, blue and blue white. That's what I think they are. Back during the turn around the, when they were, when they were really getting into double stars, though there were a lot of really colorful uh, color things for double stars. And R.H. Allen, which I'll talk about a little bit more, is uh, thought it was white and lilac. And Miss Agnes Clark, which looked at a lot of double stars, thought it was yellow and fawn. But anyway, who knows? It could have changed. Like one of them could have changed some since then. It's a. It's about 120 light years away. This one's messed up. It's got the A component, the the dimmer star, and the B component, the brighter star. Uh, this is out. This is. Uh, Alpha Canis Venetici 1, and this is Alpha Canis Venetici 2. Well, anyway, the brighter star uh, is actually a variable star, as well as being a double star. It, I don't remember exactly how much it varies. Um, the story of Porcaroli is, is it, it actually had no name before 1660. A physician named Sir Charles Scarborough claimed that the star shone with special brilliance on the eve of the King's return to London, May 29th, 1660. And that was after uh, uh, Charles I, had, that was Charles II that returned to London. His father, Charles I, had been beheaded ten, about 10 years earlier. Uh, so this was England's return to monarchy. And the story goes, he suggested this to Edmund Haley. Um, a French cartographer uh, put it put it on a 1665 map, though, as the heart of Charles' martyred king, referring to Charles I, who who was beheaded in 1650. So, um, and Ian Ridpith uh, uh, actually confirms that thinks that's that's what it is. So, basically, it's thought that it, it refers back to Charles I instead of Charles II, but it fits both of them kind of. M3, and this is a this is by Danny Flippo. It's a globular cluster first cataloged by Messier in 16, 1764. It's one of the largest and brightest, and is made up of about half a million stars, 11.4 uh, million light years old, and about 34,000 light years away. It's isolated from the other from other globular clusters. Most of them are in the summer sky, and this is in the spring sky, uh, and and probably the westernmost of, of the clusters. Um, one thing that makes it different from other globular clusters is it contains 274 known variable stars. And, uh, and there's been a lot of study of this cluster compared to other clusters. And if you, if you do the globular cluster observing award, you have to classify each cluster as to its shapely Sawyer uh, classification, which is how how dense it is in the center. And they range from one to 12, and this one's uh, supposed to be around the class six. And this is M51, the double, uh, the Whirlpool galaxy. And you can see it's a, it's a double galaxy with an arm going to a second galaxy. And it was first cataloged by Messier in 1773, and it's 31 million light years away. And here's photos by Danny Flippo and Chris Lasley uh, that I found. And it is, uh, I didn't put this up here, but it is uh, uh, visible in small telescopes. Uh, also, it's pretty nice in small, tele in average telescopes, I'll say six, eight inches, something like that. This is M63, the uh, Sunflower Galaxy, and it's also a spiral galaxy. And uh, it was discovered by Pierre Machain and cataloged by Messier in 1779. 
and this magnitude 8.5 and also visible in binoculars and almost around 30 million light years away. And I hadn't really heard of Pierre Machain before I went through this, but he, he's mentioned in two or three of these, these Messier objects. And uh, so he, it turns out he and uh, Messier worked together somewhat in, uh, and were two, the two people that d developed this, initiated the study of deep sky objects and, and they were both into comets. So he was, uh, he was a little bit, uh, Messier, that's one thing about Messier is uh, astronomers live a long time. Look at, look how long Messier, he was 97. Uh, Pierre Metchen didn't last, he was only 60. But uh, anyway, a lot of times astronomers live a long time. So that's good for us. M94 is a spiral galaxy, uh, 16 million light years away. And it was discovered by Pierre Machain in 1781 and cataloged by Messier two days later. So evidently those two worked together. Um, and it was, it's about ninth magnitude. And this photo is by Jalisa. This is M106, a spiral galaxy, uh, 24 million light years away, magnitude 9.5. And all four of these galaxies, when you compare them to uh, like galaxies in uh, Virgo and 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 Coma Bernices, I'd say these are these are not bad at, at uh, nine point five being the dimmest, um, and it was discovered by Pierre Machain, and th here's a photo by Chris Lasley, and I had one on here by Danny Flippo, but he took another one and it, he just put it on on uh, Facebook, so I caught this is his most recent one off of Facebook. I talked about La Superba, which is a variable star, Y Canis Minatici, and uh, it's a striking red giant star. It's a carbon star and semi-regular variable from 4.86 to 5.88 with a period of 267.8 days. And uh, so this is this is one of the two, a few red star variables that you can, carbon stars that you can see. Um, and it's a e real easy binocular object. Uh, and I went ahead and, and, and printed out a chart for it. And if anybody wants to chart, you can email me at, e at my email address here. But uh, this is an AFSO chart. And you can see what an AFSO chart gives you is, uh, is the magnitude variation, the period, the type, uh, spectral analysis, location and a chart number, but also it gives you a location of the star. And this is not to be easy because it's gonna be red, a lot redder than the rest of the stars. But also it gives you the other chart stars in the, in the area to, uh, uh, to compare it to. And these are very valuable for more than just, just uh, uh, variable stars. I've printed out my I printed out these charts several times for objects that I needed a good chart on. And here's a couple of books that I that I used uh, for the alternate constellations and 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 looked at both of them today for the got excerpts out of both of them today. I bought this one in Portland, not knowing what it was. This R. Hinckley Allen, published 1899, and I guess it's still published, uh, and it it's got. It's just remarkable the information it's got. If you like historical information, it, it's got it's got a lot of information on on individual stars and constellations, uh, and it's pretty essential for the alternate constellation program. And this has been a real interesting book by Ian Ridpath. I think it was published like uh, uh, over thirty years ago, and uh, but it's it's just really a fun read. Uh, Rocky, I'll just interrupt you real quick. Yeah, I, I've got uh, Ian Ridpath's Star Tales. It is, it's a great book. Uh, it is out of print, but if you can oh, find a copy, yeah, if you find a copy, get it. Uh, especially if you're into constellation lore and mythology. I think I got mine from Amazon for less than ten dollars. Yeah, that, that's where I got used. Mine. <laughs> but he also has a website called Star Tales, where it's yeah. pretty much the book. Most of, most of the content of the book is put up on the web page. Yeah. So anyway, if y'all want to check that out, just, just search Ian Ridpath Star Tales. 
Anyway, sorry, Rocky, I'll let you get back to it. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's it. That's okay. all I had. Okay. Any questions or comments? I don't know if there's a story with a guy with the two dogs that any kind of mythology? Uh -huh. What now? First guy that with the two dogs, he, I don't know, remember the name, started with an M. Oh. Uh, he, he's carrying a, a spear in one hand, he's got a, a scythe in the other hand. He looks pretty dangerous. <laughs> well, that's Boote's. Uh, and, and I don't know why, you know, I, I guess he's driving the bear there. The other legend about Boote's is that, uh, uh, is that the Big Dipper is a plow, and he was the inventor of the plow, and he's uh, uh, pushing the plow around the around the uh, the pole. So that's that, and that goes back to Greek. So that's that's one of the myth mythological stories about about him. Yeah, and the Romans have him as a shepherd. A shepherd. Mm -hmm. And the dogs are protecting the flock. Okay. So multiple stories about him, but but not really. The two dogs didn't come about until the sixteen uh, hundreds. Uh, it sounds like anyone else have a, any questions for Rocky? I just had a. Uh, I wanted to say he kind of he's had a great pun, but he missed it. He was talking about bear and he had the Ursa Major. So I posted a little thing that said bear versus bear. <laughs> I saw that. He, he passed right over that one. I didn't see it. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, that one gave me a headache, John. So I'm going to have to have a bear aspirin. <laughs> oh, here you go. He's here all really unbearable. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Uh, does it? Does anyone else want to say anything? Or, no, no, no more jokes, please. But if you have any comments or questions for Rocky, okay. Good well, job, I'm Rocky. Good. I enjoyed that. Thank you. It was Thank good. You. I always good. enjoy Rocky socks. Good job. Good to see you, Jane. By the way, what's John doing in his backyard? I'm. Uh... Just, uh, I'm going to take a picture later on when it gets dark. So, yeah, it, as it gets dark, the contrast will go away on the camera. If, it, if it'll stay connected. <laughs> Intriguing. I'm having some technical difficulties. All right, well, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you. And Michael Borelli is going to be talking to us about open clusters, I believe. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Open right. clusters that are towards the western part of the sky, some of them are disappearing for a while. Good okay. Morning. So let me go to my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So the uh, title is Open Star Clusters Now in the Western Sky. And So the uh, reason I chose open cl star clusters is that, believe it or not, over my years of being an amateur astronomer, that they're often overlooked by people. When they look at deep sky objects, they tend to talk about and go out observing nebulae, galaxies, and globular clusters, and often overlooking the open star clusters. And I don't understand that because when you're observing the open star clusters visually in your telescope, they look more like the images of them that appear in online or in books and magazines than those of the other DSOs. I mean, if you, some, any of you have ever looked at M51 through a six inch telescope, you see two blurry objects. You don't see all the wonderful spirals and everything that showed up in the picture that Rocky showed earlier. So, um, most of the stars and the OCs are, are bright enough and you can actually see the colors. A lot of times dim objects like nebula and galaxies are not bright enough to stimulate the color receptors, the cones in our eyes. And so they kind of look gray, but in open clusters, you can see colors and they're really very pretty. 
And so I just wanted to point out and have this talk to help just enforce that open star clusters are beautiful deep sky objects that are really worth your attention. And I'm going to show you some that um, you can see now. Some are you get to catch early in the evening, but, you know, it's worth the trip. And most of the pictures I'm going to show you, I took with my six inch F5 telescope right here in Little Rock. And so it's just wanted to point out so that people can see these things even in Little Rock and take decent pictures of them. There's several other pictures I didn't have. So I either copped them off the internet or I had several people, uh, Jim Dixon and Chris Lassley were kind enough to send me some images. So just sit back. I'm just gonna whip through some pretty pictures and hopefully that will, excite you to go out over the next few days. I think it's supposed to be clear tonight, tomorrow, and even later next week and go see these open clusters while they're still there. So, uh, don't need that one there. So anyway, one of the first ones, and it's low in the sky now, but it's one of the most beautiful sights you can get into a low power uh, telescope is the double cluster in Perseus. And it's at a distance of 7,500 light years age 12.8 million years old, and they're just two. They're also called H and Chi Persei. And what's beautiful about it, you can see all different colors, yellow and blue and red and orange. And in a low power eyepiece, you see both of them together. It is stunning. Now this is one I pulled off the internet, but I wanted to show you that the, uh, in Taurus, you can see the Pleiades, and that's pretty easy to catch. Uh, it looks like a little big dipper, you know, mini dipper. And But a lot of people miss the Hyades. So this is Aldebaran, the uh, eye of the bull in Taurus. And these stars around us, around it, are, are part of an open cluster. And it's one of the closest um, clusters to us, only 151, excuse me, I got to go backward, only 151 light years away, whereas the uh, Pleiades are 444 light years away. And you can see these both of them beautifully with binoculars and a low power uh, telescope. But uh, Jim Dixon, thanks to Jim, sent us this really beautiful close up. I, my camera and telescope, I can't fit the Pleiades completely in my field of view, but Jim can with his uh, F1.9 uh, Celestron with the uh, Hyperstar, I believe is what it's called. Is that correct, Jim? Him, yes, that's it. That's it. But you can see that you can, you can see the big, the little dipper of the Pleiades, but you see these nebulosity, uh, often referred to as the Maropa Nebula. And you could barely, I can barely see it in my eight inch in a very, very dark sky. I can't see it in my six inch, but um, it shows a beautifully photographed, and this is just a stunning picture. All right, I had to pull this one why off. Is, the why is it called? What is it called? What kind of nebula was it called? It's called the Merope. It's named after one of the stars, the Seven Sisters, if you look uh, at the mythology. Yeah. And originally, the, they were just calling it the, the biggest bunch of, of the nebulas around the star Merope, and it just referred to that nebula, but then the astronomers called the whole thing the Merope Nebula. So that's what happened. So this one is uh, M36. It's one of a nice cluster of, uh, Hunter there, a nice group of open clusters in the constellation of Auriga. And um, I pull, had to pull this one off the internet because my picture of it sucked. Uh, but it's a, it's a good, uh, nice cluster. Oops, excuse me. And um, it's got a lot of blue stars in it, but some other ones. And it's uh, age is about 25 million years. And then here you have M37. It's a uh, older cluster, it's 400 million years old and a radius 12 light years and it's about 4,511. So if you look at the difference, when you look in the sky, you look at it and say it's about 10 times far away from us as the Pleiades. So you can get that scale when you look at it in your telescope compared to the Pleiades, you're like, oh, pretty interesting. So it gives you some idea of how distance affects things because they're both about the same radius. This is M38 in Auriga also. And what I like about it, there's several open star clusters in Auriga that are Messier objects like M38 here, but there's also some NGC dimmer clusters there. And you can see one down here, NGC 1907. Uh, they're actually not that 
far a dis, you know, different distance, and they have a very similar radius, but you can see how the distance affects the parent size that you see. And the uh, NG 1907 is about twice as old as this one. So you see there's more blue stars here, and here there's more yellow uh, and some white and, and some uh, red stars. And the, you know, the bluer stars have burned themselves out. This one is uh, M41 in, uh, hang on. The way my thing is coming up, it's blocking me here. Let's see if I can pull this out of the way. Uh, I can't. So anyway, and that's in Canis Major in a distance of 2300 light years. And the age is uh, not 190 million uh, years old and a radius of 12.5 light years. What I really love about this cluster is you get a, it's a very big one. You see white stars, blue stars, yellow, and orange. And it's just such a pretty cluster to look at. And it really looks like this in your telescope, even in a three inch. Now, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, open star clusters. And I was taking an image of Jim. That was the night we were out at the uh, observatory, you, me, and Neil Shaw. And then the clouds rode in too, too early. So I pulled this one off the internet. And this one's called Caroline's Cluster or Caroline's Rose. And it is actually as bright as some of the other Messier objects. I don't know why it wasn't ever included in the Messier catalog, but it's beautiful. Blue stars, yellow, red, white. And um, it's just an amazing cluster. It's 2.2 uh, billion years old. So some of the blue stars they believe formed from the dust that was kicked out from some of the other stars that already burned itself out. And so they reformed in the cluster. So it's a, it's a beautiful cluster. Uh, easy to see. Now, if you go to Puppis, there's quite a few clusters. And this is one I pulled from the internet. And you can see M46 and M47 here. And they're both very uh, similar distance from us. And they both have very similar, um, what's going to call it, uh, constitutions and age. It's just, you can see the stars here are not as bright as in M46, I mean, M47 rather, so. So this is M46 and the nice thing about it, so it's a distance of 5,500 light years, 251 million years old. It has a planetary nebula around one of the stars in here. So I pulled this image off the internet because I've been trying to photograph it where I get the cluster showing up well, plus the planetary nebula. So that's your bonus uh, uh, for looking at this cluster, you have NGC 2438 as a planetary nebula. So it's very nice. You can actually see the planetary nebula visually at the, when you're at the uh, RRO, but not here in Little Rock or in Conway, I'm sure you won't see it either. And then there's M47. And again, a little closer and age only 78 million years old. So they're very, different contrast, you see these much brighter stars that probably similar stars existed in M46, but they've already burned themselves out. This is M93 in Puppis. Again, another one that's right around 3000 light years away, 387 million years old, 10, year, uh, 10 light year radius. And you can see beautiful red stars, yellow, and still some blue and whites. It's a nice little tight cluster as it readily visible. M50, and this is in Monoceros, again, almost about 3000 light years away. It's a very pretty cluster and very easily seen and found. It is visible with the naked eye if you look for it. And it's a good test of how, you're, how good your eyesight are if you can pick it up uh, when you're at the RRO. This is a challenge to see. So this is NGC 2506 in Monoceros. It's a bit of a challenge from Little Rock. I could barely see it visually, but I got a nice picture of it here from Little Rock. And again, it's got a wide range of colors and it's about 2.1 billion years old, not about half is the age of our, our, our sun. Here's another one where you get a double bonus. So this is M35 in uh, Gemini. And you can see that you also get NGC 2158. It's about uh, four times, not quite, three times actually more, three times the distance of M35 here. 
which has a lot of blue stars, a couple of red. And then when you look back here, this one's 2 billion years old compared to 175 million. And not too different in radius. So what's funny, I always love this cluster, is you can see both of them in, in the same eyepiece. Look at the shape of M35. It actually has a very similar shape to here. So I kind of look at this as a time machine, looking at here's what it is now, and maybe this is what it's going to look like in the next 2 billion years. So and so get a lot more red stars here also from interstellar dust, but it's a beautiful color. As you can see, look at all the colors and the stars in this field. It's, uh, it's, it's like color television with astronomy. And uh, this is NGC 2420 in Gemini. Very easy to pick up with your telescope. Uh, again, very colorful. And just what I wanted you to say, sit back and just look at these pretty colors and these stars. This is what it looks like in the tell. You will see these colors, you know, unlike some of the other some of the Messier objects. Uh, this is uh, one of the bigger ones that uh, clusters you can see the Beehive M44 in uh, Cancer. It's a naked eye image. Uh, Chris, lastly, was kind enough to provide uh, a, a nice image of it because my camera's field of view just couldn't fit it in. But look at the beautiful contrast in colors. You get some red and orange, blue, and there's, there's white. It's a, it's a beautiful cluster. It's also known as the Precep or Beehive. And you can see this in Cancer. You, you, it's, cancer is not a bright constellation, but this actually sticks out pretty nicely and very easily. See, you can see it from Little Rock and you can easily see it uh, from the RRO. And then the, oops. Last one on my list is M67 in Cancer. Again, 2,800 light years away. This one's 4 billion years old. So it's basically the same age as our sun, 10 light year radius. And so you will see some whitish blue stars, but a lot of yellow and some red stars. So it's very, very colorful uh, area to be into. And these clusters, some of them, the ones in Cancer are more towards the, the meridian getting, you know, and so they're, they're going to be around for a while, but the ones I showed you first are very, very in the West, including especially the double cluster in Perseus. So I encourage you, if you're interested in the open star clusters, and maybe you saw the beauty of these objects, what I presented, get out there with your binoculars or your telescope and just have fun with them. They're just beautiful objects. And that's it. Thank you, Michael. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask Michael? Well, I just wanted to comment. I think your opening statement that uh, these are these are things that you can really see well, um, in in a kind of over overlooked. Uh, I you get a response from people when they see something like that for the first time it's um it's impressive with with most any scope whereas if you you show them a dimmer object like a uh, a galaxy they're like oh that little fuzzy thing <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think open clusters and uh, especially globular clusters at least for me are, are show stoppers for people but it's just like I said, it's amazing when you look at our uh, web, our Facebook page and things like that, not too many people post pictures of open clusters. I've been trying to do a few of them here and there just to get that interest going. Um, they're great objects. So hopefully people will be inspired. If not, oh, well, I tried. <laughs> Michael, what was the, uh, the, the one in Gemini uh, you were talking about that uh, has the, the colors uh, that are so distinctive? Well, you have, there's M35, which um, has a very blue, and then there's the 26, and then hang on a second, I got to get to the other one, the uh, smaller one, which is... Uh, right before the beehive. Yeah, it's, uh, hang on, I'll get there. There it is. Um, it's NGC 2420. It's... It's actually fairly bright. It, it didn't get called as a Messier object. It's quite bright. And the color variation from blue to, it's got a lot of yellows and reds. It's just pretty. Okay. Can you, can you pick out those colors with binoculars or do you need a scope? No, you can't really pick out the colors in binoculars. You can barely see this with binoculars. It's kind of a fuzzy spot, 
but when you pick it up at the telescope, even a three inch, it's the colors are very distinct. All right. Does anyone have any hey, other uh, questions? I shared something. Can you see it? Uh-huh. Uh, okay. I just wanted to bring out about the pre -SP. Uh, something that's kind of neat is there's a star on each side of it. And uh, of course he said, he, uh, Michael just said the pre-SP is the beehive or the, or the manger. And as the manger, it's got the Northern donkey and this is, uh, and the Southern donkey, Acelius borealis and Acelius australis. So it's, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, the cluster uh, sandwich, you know, with a donkey on Book ended by two donkeys. But anyway, I just wanted to share that. <laughs> yeah, the the beehive, excuse me, the beehive is an easy cluster to pick out. And if you haven't yeah. seen it before, uh, get out tonight, take a look at it. it. It's it's a sight to see. Okay, anything else? Well, I've got a presentation as well. Oh, okay. Uh, Michael asked me to uh, kickstart. Um, a, a set, a, a series of uh, presentations on Messier objects. And so I picked uh, a few that I've taken pictures of that are in the uh, evening sky right now, mostly in the evening sky. Uh, and so uh, it's going to overlap a little bit. I wasn't expecting uh, so many overlaps between Rocky's presentation and Michael's and my own, but uh, we'll just have to Live through we'll that. suffer through. Well, yeah. you know, those of us who are teachers, we've always said, tell them once, tell them again, and tell them a third time. I was going to say, it doesn't hurt to repeat. <laughs> it reinforces it. Yeah, well, hang on. Let me get sharing here. Okay. Well, Jim, Jim's on. Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Share. And. All right, can you see my big screen now? Yeah. All right. So this is uh, April uh, Messier objects. Okay. Um, yeah, by this time of year, the last of the fall Messier objects are just barely above the horizon. Uh, I mean, you need to take a look now or wait several months uh, for your next chance. The, uh, the, um, the, that's, uh, the winter Messiers are a little bit better, uh, but they're actually getting, they're past the meridian and getting cl uh, close to setting as well. You know, another, I remember back in February, I was uh, planning on doing some uh, imaging of the Orion Nebula and the um, first full moon and then clouds and then the Snowmageddon hit. And the next thing I know, it's nearing the horizon. So it could happen again. Uh, all of these images that you're about to see were by, taken by me, most if not all here at the uh, River Ridge Observatory. And there's a few of us here tonight. Uh, first off is uh, the um, Andromeda and its satellites. And, uh, whoops, sorry. There we go. Uh, trying to get this guy out of the way. What we have here are three Messier objects. Of course, the biggest uh, uh, is um, the Andromeda galaxy itself. And that is a uh, visible to the naked eye, although you, you can't really you can tell what it is. Uh, close to the center and a little bit to the right of center here is a little spherical there and that's uh, M32 uh, and then over in the lower left uh, elongated is uh, M110. Now this picture is probably the best thing I've ever done of it but it still uh, doesn't show a whole lot of detail in the arms like there's a number of uh, hydrogen alpha areas that are glowing in the red and also the um, uh, the Andromeda galaxy is quite large. Uh, for all my life, it was thought to be 
as large or, or larger rather than the Milky Way galaxy. But the recent studies apparently uh, have uh, changed that view and the, the, our galaxy might actually be larger. Um, one thing I, uh, that I need to take a look for is a very large globular cluster called Mayall 2, which is actually at least as large as our own Omega Centauri. And uh, it's not in this picture. I, I, I located it on, on the internet. Uh, if you go to the upper left and keep going, uh, we're well beyond my picture. That's where it is. It's, uh, it's actually a fairly good distance away from, from uh, the center of the galaxy. But it is quite large. Uh, like I said, it might be, it's at least as large. The numbers I saw looked to be about the same, but they were describing it as larger. So it's just about to disappear behind the tree. So, you know, now's your chance. Uh, next off is the uh, Triangulum Galaxy, which is uh, a little bit uh, south ish of, uh, of uh, Andromeda. It's uh, it's the third largest galaxy in the local group uh, of galaxies, which uh, I think is a sphere of about 15 million light years. But I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm not wrong there. It is roughly uh, face on to us. It is in the small uh, constellation of Triangulum. It is, uh, M33 is really, it's dim. I mean, it's got to total brightness is it's bright enough to be seen in very dark skies. And I think I have seen it in, in, in like at, uh, the Buffalo River, uh, naked eye. Uh, but when I was looking for it a few years ago for my Messier pr uh, program for the Astronomical League, I was looking for like 30 minutes before I realized that I was looking at it the entire time. It was just the uh, surface brightness was so low that it was very difficult to make out. But it's actually like the Andromeda galaxy. It's a, uh, it's pretty large. It's, it's relatively bright, but it's still, it's so spread out. Uh, it is a classic spiral, as you can tell from that picture, and uh, it's, it's a challenge. Next, we go to the Pleiades, and you saw this picture a few minutes ago from Michael. Uh, it's a little further south. It's getting low on the horizon as well. Uh, it is, it it's, uh, lies about 440 light years away. What I was surprised to learn recently is this, all this nebulosity you see here, that's not part of it. That is a uh, molecular cloud that happens to lie between here and there. Uh, so if you had your magic spaceship that could uh, zoom across and, you know, be looking at there from about 90 degrees away in a gigantic circle, you probably wouldn't see that. You'd probably see just the, uh, the stars themselves. Next up is the salt and pepper cluster, M52 in Cassiopeia. Now, you might be thinking, oh, it's that really, really cool looking thing up in the upper left. No, that's not it. That's the bubble nebula. Uh, it happens to be the little thumbprint type of thing down there near the bottom center. Uh, I think a lot of people would uh, be forgiven for focusing on the bubble nebula, but um, it's bright enough, M52 rather, is bright enough to be seen with binoculars under dark skies. Uh, let's see, it's got about 200 stars uh, in it. The Orion Nebula. This is probably everybody's favorite nebula. Uh, me too. And it is actually, it amazes me what our, the whole our, the Orion thing, not just this nebula, but there's a vast molecular cloud spanning most, if not all, of the constellation. Uh, and this is just happens to be the brightest part. Uh, and what's really, one of the really cool things about this is when you look at that, uh, in a telescope, maybe even binoculars, you can see the nebula. You can see the the texture, the uh, uh, in there. And you can see, you can tell you're looking at a cloud in space, and that's just to me that is just uh, really awesome. Now the Orion Nebula 
is made up of two Messier objects, uh, M42 and M43. Yeah, I don't know if you can see my mouse. I'm not sure if that's being shared or not, but uh, tor almost it is. Yeah, it's there. Right there. That's M43. Yeah, it's kind of the uh, uh, the little uh, redheaded stepchild of the nebula. Uh, and then everything up here and to uh, to the right is the is M42 proper. Over here, part of the molecular cloud, but uh, this is the running man, and you have to turn your head to the left. You can see him, see him running. Bode's Nebula, that's next, and that, it's still called the Nebula, even though it's a galaxy. Uh, and uh, this is a picture I took a couple years ago. I don't remember if I, this was with my DSLR or with. Uh, my uh, dedicated astronomy camera, but uh, it is a what's called a grand design spiral galaxy in Ursa Major. And what that means is basically it's got a dense core and it's got well-defined spiral arms. Uh, and it's what you what you think of when you think of spiral galaxy. Uh, and it's about twelve million light years away, and I mean, just about any telescope will show it. Uh, but you need a really large telescope or a camera to, to see that spiral uh, uh, structure. And it's got at least two, I'm kind of thinking up here, that might be a third arm, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it looks like it might be. Uh, not too far away, both from our point of view and in reality, is the Cigar Galaxy. And this is a uh, starburst ga uh, galaxy and uh, my picture doesn't really show it very well but here in the center it's you can see there's a little bit of red there uh, because it's actually physically close to m82 m82 is messing it up and it is going through an active starburst that is uh, say massive star form formation uh, going on in that galaxy and that is resulting in the basically the, st uh, the stellar winds from those newborn stars are, are causing hot gas to is to uh, go out i think chris lasley did a really good uh, picture of this not too long ago uh but you can see it's glowing red uh in his picture you can see it much better uh next is uh, the M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, this is also people, some of people's favorites. Uh, Rocky touched on it earlier this evening. Uh, it is actually two galaxies. Uh, the uh, this one down here is uh, you know, called NGC 5195, and they are physically touching. And basically, uh, the larger one is. Uh, impacting the smaller one, although I think the smaller one's getting a few, uh, uh, a few little punches in too. It is, uh, it's a face on galaxy. Uh, the um, M51 itself is an active uh, safer galaxy. And what that means is it's just got a massive, uh, doesn't just mean, but it means it's got a massive uh, black hole in the center causing it to be very bright and energetic. It is also, in the last 10 years, there have been at least two supernovae uh, in this galaxy that have been visible. I haven't, actually, I, I had a picture of one at one point and lost it, but um, I guess because we're looking at it face on and it's not really that far away, we have an opportunity to see just about any supernova in this galaxy. You know, um, looking in the, um, uh, the Milky Way, we really don't get a chance to see that very often. And that one was taken about two years ago as well. The Pinwheel Galaxy is another classic spiral galaxy, and uh, this time in Ursa Major. It's, uh, it's a little bit larger than our. Oh, it's not a little bit. It's about fifty percent larger than our own Milky Way. Uh, this picture hints at some uh, red, glowing hydrogen uh, two uh, regions. Basically, big, big, hot gas areas. Uh, I'm pointing my mouse to one. That I've seen other people who have done better pictures than this, where the, these show really red 
Um, and um, I think that's another one over here. It seems, you know, it's, it's off kilter here. It's not perfectly spherical. There are some uh, satellite galaxies that are disrupting its, uh, what might otherwise be a perfectly uh, uh, round shape. But you can see it's got one, two, three, four, maybe five spiral arms there. Uh, now we're moving uh, to uh, uh, Mount, um, globular clusters. I was going to say, I think I'm just about done here. M uh, Messier 3. Uh, Messier 3, and all these other objects I've shown you tonight had nice, cool nicknames, right? Well, this one doesn't. This one's called M3, uh, probably after a, a, a highway in Great Britain. But it is, I, I think Rocky already touched, I think it was Rocky. Yeah, because Michael is open clusters. Uh, Rocky touched on it. Uh, it is It is really a, a fine uh, globular cluster. Uh, uh, my personal favorite is M5, but I don't have a picture of that. And it's a little bit further away, uh, further in the uh, morning. But these, uh, as Rocky was saying, these are ancient uh, objects uh, that order, that orbit, excuse me, the, uh, uh, the glob, the, um, sorry, sorry, the uh, Mese, oh, I'm just messing up, the Milky Way. The Milky Way, and of course, the um, Andromeda Galaxy has its own uh, set. I think there's something like 150 of these guys. I don't recall when I took this picture, but I thought it turned out pretty good. Um, let's see, this one's about 34,000 light years. I think actually uh, Rocky already told you that. And it's just barely, or might be barely uh, visible to the naked eye in dark skies like at the, uh, the Buffalo River. And finally, I think, is the Great Hercules Cluster. Now, this one does have a nice uh, nickname. Uh, and it is, certainly it's the, the biggest and brightest in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, in the Southern, there's the Omega Centauri, which may not even be a glob globular cluster. Uh, and it is uh, about the same size as uh, uh, 47 2 Canae. Uh, but that one's a little bit brighter. It's easily visible in binoculars and potentially visible with the unaided eye. Uh, it's about 150 light years in diameter and several hundred thousand stars inside it. I'm, I've, I've heard as much as a million, but I'm not, um, but I'm not sure of that number. Whoops, sorry. Just when I was getting ready to point to something. See that? That's a really cool red star there. Uh, I mean, it's so red. I, uh, but there's another one up there. Maybe it, that might be a processing artifact. I don't know. But anyway, uh, that was it. I did about 10 or so objects. I wasn't counting. And uh, if we do any more of these, uh, someone else uh, will have the uh, opportunity to uh, do a roundup of Messier objects. And uh, just wondering if anybody had any questions. And I will stop sharing. Anyone? Any more questions uh, for Jim? Well, hey, Jim, I just have a question. How long have you been doing astrophotography? Uh, I did some back in the, the aughts. Uh, I did that for about five years or so until my camera died. Uh, and then I took a break, uh, but I have uh, been doing deep sky again uh, probably about three years. Uh, I was doing planets for a while, but those are really hard. Uh, I don't, <laughs> uh, I liked doing planets for a while because I didn't have any competition. Uh, uh, but then there, it's really hard. But that, be, but to answer your question, uh, about three years plus the earlier stint of about five. Hmm. The reason why Jim and I were talking about doing the Messier objects to get people to see them is remember last year we were trying to put together the Messier marathon and that's where in one night you try to get all 110 objects 
And you can do that in some in some, a certain space of time in March and April. Well, we didn't. We canceled it last year because of COVID nineteen, and obviously we didn't even think of doing it here. But we were trying to see if there's a way that we can present some of these Messier objects to our club members by having a session where people present maybe ten to twelve or so in in a, in a session. And we don't necessarily have to do it on the meetings and on the chat sessions, but we could do that. Uh, if people are interested, we might even be able to do one every week i don't know uh, so email me all right i'm the membership chairman so email me uh, members is that something you'd like to see is that something you want to see our club present to you let me know and we'll try and do that anyone else have any questions for jim or michael or rocky Well, all right, it's uh, after eight o'clock, I see, and I know a lot of you are wanting to get out, set your telescopes up, or we've got a good night for it. Uh, so I'm going to close things out, unless there's any other announcements that people want to make. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Uh, good observing, and good seeing good all of you. Good to see everybody. Uh -huh. Same here. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.